thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And thanks so many of you for coming tonight. I didn't expect so many. You know, there was a bishop once who went to a parish and there was, there was some function. Now, there were very few people there. So he said to the parish priest, Father, oh, there are very few people here. Didn't you tell them the bishop was coming? No, my lord, said the parish priest, but the news must have leaked out. <laughs> so whatever news has leaked out, you're all here tonight. I'm going to, going to talk, in a way, a lot of it, I'm, I'm afraid, because I'm an old man. It's going to be reminiscence, because uh, uh, that's the way life is. But I do want, in the midst of, re of uh, reminiscences of popes that I've known, to actually indicate how how God writes straight with crooked lines, uh, and how the development of the Catholic Church, not a lot change, development uh, over the past 60 years, uh, how the Catholic Church has, as it were, changed not its doctrine, but its face, its attitude, so as to confront and to be in the, in the, in the modern world effectively, so as to be able to witness to what it believes more effectively. So I'm going to do this uh, uh, gradually, uh, starting with one of my favorite popes. Well, what well, I call the popes, of course, but this one, Pope John. When I was a student in Rome, I was a student from 1950 to 1957, long, long time ago. And uh, I, went, I went on a, a key to have one uh, a holiday, for a few days up to Venice. And those of you who haven't been, fantastic. If you go in, it was, it was the um, 23rd, 24th, of, no, 27th of August, the vigil of the feast of San Justinian, who was the patron, of, one of the patrons of Venice. And we crossed over in our vaporetta. Everything was magical. Anyway, I mentioned it because the next day, uh, the patriarch of Venice was a man called Andrew Roncalli, uh, a very elderly man, he was rowed over by the gondoliers for the mass in uh, St. Mark's Cathedral, Syracuse. And at the mass, there was another archbishop there called uh, Montini, who was actually saying the mass. Um, so there was a huge crowd there. And afterwards, they came out on the balcony. And the, and the people loved their patriarch, uh, Archbishop. And they clapped him and cheered. But he stepped back. I still see this. And he pushed. He pushed the Archbishop Monti, who was the Archbishop of Milan. And, and said, I still see him saying, You clap him, he's going to be the next Pope. Because everybody thought that Monti would be the next Pope after Pope Pius XII. But what happened? Very unexpectedly, Pope John was elected as, as, as the Pope. And, uh, in a way, after the rather stultified atmosphere of uh, <coughs> the church of the times of Pope Pius XII, uh, Pope John was a breath of fresh air. He, uh, first of all, uh, he's very human. He told stories. One day, about somebody asked him, uh, Pope John, how many people work in the Vatican? He said, about half. <laughs> <laughs> he was very human. And uh, he went first of all to a prison. And a prisoner rushed up to him and said, Holy Father, I'm a murderer, would God ever forgive me? What would the Pope do? He just went up and threw his arms around him and embraced him. Um, it was that humanity. But of course, the brave thing he did, and I expected it, he did, was to call what was called the Second Vatican Council. And uh, a lot of people said, This is bad, we don't need another council. But he, he persisted. And he began the council with the words, I have no time for prophets of gloom. And uh, I say the same today, if I, if I were Pope, I'm saying it was a God. No time for prophets of gloom. The church is always uh, developing, changing, uh, bringing new, new insights. And the Vatican Council was hugely important because it it didn't change things, but it altered many things. Altered, for instance, the, the, the uh, language of the mass. I was brought up with the mass every Sunday. It was in Latin. And when I was a student for seven years in Rome, I went to a place called the Gregorian University, where all the lectures were in Latin. 
I remember my first exam. This Jesuit babbled away at me in Latin. And they said, the end, way out and on. Yes, or no. So I thought, oh, my God, not very few the same way. He's babbling away. They had it sort of as Italian man, not like you know, rainy, weedy, 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 Oxford. So, <laughs> he said, uh, so I said, no, uh, quay. And he did this. I said, no, 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 no. He said, bene. <laughs> they, were very, they were very kind to young English students who weren't very used to uh, time, time, time. But uh, so it was a, a kind of different world. And I won't go into the pre Vatican II world, but what changed at the Vatican Council? Changed, yes, the language of the people. And uh, also opening up the Bible. The Catholics on the whole were not very uh, familiar as we should have been with the, with the Bible and its rituals. It opened up uh, openness to fellow Christians in a way that not, had, not, had not occurred to my extent uh, before then. And I suppose, uh, above all, it looked at the church and saw the church as a communion. It was not just Pope, Cardinals, Bishops, laity, etc., priests. No, no, we are all that we belong together as the people of God. And the last thing we did was, uh, my motto, by the way, my, is called Gaudium et Spes, Joy and Hope, which is the beginning of the, 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 a document of the Council on the Church and the modern world. And so the attitudes of the Church now, instead of whether we're condemning the attitudes of the modern world, we're, we're facing it. How can we contribute, applauding what's happening in the modern world, but also giving the distinct contribution of religion and faith in our in our strange and wonderful world, then and now. So that was Paul Pope, Pope John. And what I learned from him really was his extraordinary trust in God. He, uh, he didn't know what was going to happen in his life. He came from a very humble background. And, and every time he went to a new task, he said, I trust in you. And I'll tell you a story about that. <coughs> and then he was followed by a dean, Pope. Pope uh, but Paul VI, at a very different time, implementing the Vatican Council because the church, in some ways, is like a, is like a liner. To turn round or to change at it, it takes a long time. And, uh, and Pope Paul tried very hard. He, he internationalized the courier. He paid visits abroad to India, the Philippines. Um, he started the Synod of Bishops to have more collegiality, uh, more synodality. But it never quite worked. But he was, a, he was a wonderful, he was a wonderful man. When I was a student, I was only about 18, 19, went to Rome. And after my first exam, which I passed uh, saying uh, no to the professor, <laughs> me and three other students went for a, we went to Rome in those days, it was very strict, so we went into a, a, a latteria, you know, a cafe place to have a cup of coffee and a, a bun. And three of us sat there in our cassocks, we were all cassocks. And this, uh, this rather distinguished priest came in with a very old cloak and ordered a, a, a cafe espresso. And he saw us in the corner and he came over and uh, he said, in uh, rather bad English, he must have been He said, uh, where, where are you? Or who are you? So he said, we're English college students, we've just come from our first exam. And he said, well, well, I work in the Vatican. He said, my name is uh, Monsignor Montini. And uh, I just wanted to come and welcome you and say, welcome to Rome. Uh, when I went back to see my confessor in the college, a man called Monsignor Heard, who later became a carver, he said, Monty, he'd be the next pope. And, uh, but when he became pope, he, he had a very difficult time. But he had eyes, you know Newman's definition of a gentleman? One who has eyes on all the company. And Pope, uh, pope Paul had eyes on all the company. Right and left, those who are urging him to go forward, others urging him to fall back. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. And I remember when my predecessor as Archbishop of Westminster came out to Rome, uh, and he stayed at the college. This is Cardinal Basil Hume. And he'd just come from being the Abbot of Abbot, and he was very nervous indeed to suddenly go into this rather big job. So I went with him to see Pope Paul, and he went in and they spoke together. French. And uh, he came out a different man because Pope Paul had said to him, Don't worry, uh, trust in the Lord, be a Benedictine, and 
continue a particular kind of thing. And he felt very firm. And so Paul, for me, was one who, as the Lord said to Peter, wants to confirm your brethren, encourage. And he did that to every bishop that went to see him. And uh, yeah, as I say, uh, he had a very difficult pontiff because we were trying to as it were, implement fully the Vatican Council. Uh, and it, it was kind of difficult to do that. Uh, but he, he was a very holy man and a very intelligent good man. And he was followed, yes, by Pope John Paul I, but he didn't last very long. And then he only lasted 30 days, as you remember, because that some of you will be. I remember going, I used to live down in Sussex in a place called Storrington. Every morning after my morning mass, I'd go for a little walk. And uh, I still remember the milkman coming along and was on, the, on his cart. And uh, he, he stopped. Well, he passed me and, and uh, some English work would love to give you bad news, you know. And he said, well, I've bad news for you, sir. I said, what's that? He said, well, your Pope has died. So I said, well, I, what did he die about, you know, eight weeks ago? <laughs> he said, no, not that one, this one. And uh, I could hardly believe it, you know. And, uh, and I walked around saying, God, what do you say to us? Well, first of all, say you're going to find another Pope. And secondly, maybe you ought to have an Italian this time. So we went to have Pope John Paul II, who was a remarkable man, who stemmed the flow in his own particular way. Uh, uh, there's so many things to say. Let me just say a few things about Pope John Paul II. I got to know him quite well, really. The first time I properly, I mean, properly met him was when he came to Britain in uh, 1982. He landed at Gatwick, which was in my diocese. Uh, and so I had to meet him at Gatwick with all the other bishops and all the others. But I had to go on the plane. And it was the time of the Falklands War. And, uh, and he was very, quite nervous on the plane. Uh, was, uh, anyway, he came down and um, greeted everybody. And from then on, his visit was an extraordinarily successful one. No pope had ever been to, uh, to England before. And there were some very moving events. His visit to I always remember his visit to, uh, to Canterbury Cathedral when he spoke about the hopes and the desires of so many hearts, the, the, the desire for greater communion and, and uh, unity with our, with our fellow Christians. And, uh, of course, he was a great success when he went to Scotland. The Scots, you know, he was their man, so they had a great welcome in Edinburgh and in Glasgow. And as he was leaving from Scotland at the airport, a huge crowd, and we're all singing, Will ye nay come back again? So Pope John Paul said to the Archbishop of Glasgow, Archbishop Winning, he said, Archbishop, what's that song they keep singing? He said, Holy Father, it's the song of the Scots hoping that Bonnie Prince Charlie will come back again. And he said, Oh, says Pope John Paul, I met him last week. Wrong Charlie. <laughs> He's very good with young people. I remember asking an Italian bishop, why is he so good with young people? Well, he got so young people because he came across as a free man. Not everybody totally agreed with that. But this is where I stand. And for young people, it's very important to be free. You know, just to have your own mind, but also uh, to be yourself at, at the deepest level. And he gave a, a very strong impression. I always remember one occasion, it was the World Youth Day, to have a million or more of these of young people. And one I particularly remember was in Paris. And on the last night of this, he, he decided that he would baptize 10 people, two from each continent. So they were on their stage, and it was beautiful, very French fair, beautiful lights and songs, and, and, and a million young people. And so, as you know, in a baptism, people have to ask, do you believe? So he said, do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator, etc.? And they had to say, je crois, I believe. So the ten said, je crois. And then suddenly, the Pope said, able to he shouted. Well, and all of you. And of course, the young people were sort of hesitant. You know? 
was a sort of lover, except for the bishops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then he said, well, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Born, risen from the dead, je crois. And we'll go to the together. But this time, Ralph Moore said, je crois, or I believe. And then you'll be in the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, life of the last year. Je crois, says the ten. And it will go to get a shot of very dramatically. But then everybody said, uh, je crois, or nous croyons, but he had become a kind of weaver. Because I mean, uh, it was very really wonderful in a way, because like all young people, and not only young people, young people too, there are times when you find it very difficult to believe. Do I believe? But you see, it's not just I that believe, it's we, but the face of the church. And certainly <coughs> most of these young people have realized that what we were saying is this is what I believe. Yeah. Yeah. In conjunction, even if my belief is weak, yet the faith of the church is strong. Uh, well, I won't go through all of this case because the last years of suffering. I remember going to the last audience with him when he got 2002, I went to see him. And, uh, and I decided, because he was in a wheelchair, in the last year he suffered a huge amount. So I decided that I would like speaking in Italian, which I didn't get along with, because I thought it would be easier than English. So he I remember saying to him, Holy Father, when are you going to, when are you going to beatify John Henry Newman, Carver Newman? So he said, he said, you're being a miracle, he said. I, thought, I said, Holy Father, the English aren't very good at miracles. They don't like to bully God, you know, like the Italians. And so I went out there and I said, of course, the Italian who was the best at this was a man called Padre Pio. And when I said, I, I went to see Padre Pio when I was a student, his face lit up. He said, yes, I went, I went to see him too. Padre Pio was a, a Capuchin. Was a, from the, from the east side, and, uh, was, he certainly uh, performed many, many miracles. Um, was an extraordinary old man, and Pope John Paul later he canonized him. Uh, so it was nice that the last interview I had wasn't about sort of church business; it was about holiness. And, uh, so, uh, so I, I, I remember from Pope John Paul, especially bravery, his sense of freedom, his suffering. The man who he was. And then, of course, when he died uh, in 2005, I was Archbishop uh, Westminster. So we were waiting for, 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 for the death. And immediately he died, we had, had a mass in the cathedral and a service for all the distinguished people in Britain for him. And then went out to Rome. And it was important to record that Rome was incredible because there were about three or four million people. They'd come from everywhere. They were encamped in the piazzas and uh, all night vigil was all. But remember, all the cardinals had, had never been, except for two, had never been in the conclave before. And that was because Pope John Paul reigned for so long, 24 years, that all the cardinals had died that were created by him. So, so we were all new, if you like, to a conclave. So we had the, uh, we waited for the, for the funeral. And we had to meet every day to talk together about most of the time was talking about what we had to do to observe the rules of, of the conflict. But after the after the funeral, which was a tremendous event really, and uh, from here Prince uh, Charles came, every king or president or prime minister <coughs> and, uh, and then we had to wait for for the concrete. So I just went to you a little bit what it's like to be in the concrete because at least I'm the only one here, here I suspect, who has not been there in the concrete. But it is the most dramatic. Uh, we, we, we talk together for days about the kind of hope we'd like, I'm not really mentioning names, you don't mention names. And then you come to the dramatic moment when you file into the Sistine Chapel. So we all went in in, in, a, in a procession with the litany of the saints. And when we got into the Sistine Chapel, uh, 
there are tiered ranks. There are 115 of us. And um, somebody spoke to us. And then the first dramatic moment was the, the, the senior deacon, Cardinal, Cardinal Deacon, said, Exit on this, everybody out. So all the, 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 the preacher, the servers, they all went out and there was a thud as the door was closed. There were 115 of us. And I looked around and I thought to myself, one of us is going to come out with a different colored cassock. Uh, and then we had three scrutineers, and we all had to go up before. It's very solemn because you're looking up at the last judgment of Michael Andrew. And we have to say, uh, uh, I swear before God that I will keep the secrecy of the, uh, of the country. In other words, not mention names or who you voted for or anything like that. And, uh, and then you go up and you say, I declare before God with your slip, and there's a big urn there. This is the man I think should be the, uh, the Supreme Court. And then the names are called out. So you go back to your, to your place. And I had nearly, funnily enough, next door was the uh, Cardinal Archbishop of New York, Cardinal Archbishop of, uh, uh, of, of Portugal, of, of Lisbon, and on the other side, the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, the natural Brazilian. Uh, so he was there. So we used to chat away between them. But then, after the third vote, it was eventually becoming apparent that one man was, was getting more votes than the other. And the fourth vote, I can't tell you what it was like, we all sat there and the names were being called out. It came to 65, you had to get 77, two thirds plus one, to be elected. So we had met then, Ratzinger, Ratzinger, 70, and 73, and you could have heard a pin drop. Would he get in? Would he get, would he get the number? Then it came, 77. And there was a great clap. Then the voting had to continue. And then the most solemn one, which was the senior cardinal, the dean, the, dean, the dean of the cardinals, went up to us. We could still see him sitting at the end, Carver Ratzinger, with sort his of head down. And he went up to him and said, uh, Your Eminence, do you accept to be the, the Supreme Pontiff? He said, uh, then Carmel um, said, I accept the word of God. And he said, well, what name do you take? And immediately, he said, Benedict. So he must have kind of thought about it. <laughs> but I tell you this, I, just, I think every Carmel had a name up his sleeve, just in case. <laughs> uh, well, you know I'm going to ask you what yours was, so. <laughs> so. Well, well, I did think. So, well, I, I had three names in mind. I, <laughs> I, I, I had uh, Adrian, you know Adrian spoke. Adrian, yes. I had Gregory, St. Augustine. And I don't, I shouldn't really tell you this, but in the middle I thought, Cormac the first. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't, it wasn't me. Uh, but then, uh, immediately, then he goes out, and there's a, a papal tailor outside waiting with three cassocks. Large, medium, <laughs> so he gets into the white. For after about ten minutes, he comes back, and again, that's another coming back in white. He's now pope. There's no, there's no anointing. There's no ceremony. Once you elected, once you accept, you're pope. And he went and he sat in the middle, and we all went and kissed his ring and pledged our loyalty to him. And then he spoke to us, asked for our prayers, and to other things. Then he said, "We go out and face the crowd." We followed him out, and the windows in front of the uh, Basilica of St. Peter's, we, we all sort of crowded around the windows, but he was the first person to the last crowd there. Uh, it, was, uh, it was very moving, I must say. It was very moving. And uh, I think uh, he was, in, in many ways, uh, I had. <coughs> to become Pope, you know, it may say, yes, it's a great honor and a privilege, but also a great sacrifice. I had lunch with Pope Benedict uh, <coughs> sometime, with uh, the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Robert Williams, and, uh, and we had, we had ch lunch, we talked about this and that. And I then said to the uh, to Pope, Pope Benedict, how's your book coming on? And he, he, he said, it's not coming well, it's a time. I 
might not be a fine study in Sri Lanka. And he really is a, is a scholar. And so I, I felt then, you know, with all the demands of the papacy, he, uh, he was brave to, 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 take it, to take it on. Remember his visit here to, to Britain. And his wonderful, his wonderful uh, address. I don't know if you were there, uh, I mean, uh, in Westminster Hall, and he talked to four or five prime ministers, the great and the good. But he was sort of trying to say, what does the religion add to a, in a secular society? And he talked about the, the, the link between faith and reason, between religion and secularity, and how religion is hugely important to purify what reason cannot do. Uh, it was a brilliant, a brilliant talk, well worth reading. Anyway, uh, the only thing else I want to say about Pope Benedict is the great bravery in, uh, in resigning. The first Pope, 900 years to resign. And uh, his last speech, and I've got a little extract here, moved me very much. This last speech in the, in the square on the, the, the day before he resigned, before he stepped down, when he said, I think my life is as Pope. There have been moments of joy and light but also difficult moments. I have felt like St. Peter with the apostles in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. The Lord has given us many days of sunshine and gentle breeze, but there have also been times when the seas were rough and the wind against us, as in the whole history of the church it has always been, and the Lord seemed to sleep. Nevertheless, I always knew the Lord is in the bark, and that the bark of the church is not mine, not ours, but his, and he shall not let her sink. Beautiful words. Of, uh, in other words, the troubles that there have been in the church throughout its long history, and there have been so many troubles, and especially indeed in recent times, which we need to go into. But we know that the church is not about infallibility, but indefectibility. That it would always be there, maybe up and down in different generations, in different parts of the world. Uh, but it would be there. There will always be that witness. In in the church to, to, uh, to the Lord, to the promises, and, and to the death and resurrection of, of Jesus. And so he resigned. It was a great a shock surprise, but uh, somehow when I went out to Rome, because I was there, I didn't actually go into the conclave, but uh, I was there for all the, the preparatory meetings. Uh, I didn't go in because I was over 80, just over 80, so I was a bit miffed with <laughs> so, uh, so uh, the only car was under 80. But I, as I said, I know Pope Francis quite well. We were made cardinals together. We sat next to each other at meetings. And very interesting, uh, I say, going right straight with crooked lies. I went out for supper with him. This was before the meeting started. Just to, uh, just to uh, sort of we talked on actually about who we would want and what we would But he never thought he would have a chance. He was, after all, people were saying, we need a, a younger man, you know, with all the to take command and control of all the troubles and govern the curia and so on. That he was 76, 77. So he didn't think he would get it. But during those meetings before, uh, gradually it dawned on many colleagues, including myself, that uh, the church, because Pope Benedict had resigned, age didn't matter. Because if, if another pope felt that he was too old or infirm, then he could resign. And so he looked at the quality of the man rather than the age. Or, uh, and, and, uh, and I remember uh, saying that, that, uh, that we ought to look at that, that at the quality of the man. Don't worry about the age uh, and see whether indeed there is such a man who can bring a fresh air uh, to the church, a fresh vision. And uh, there was a last mass that called for, pro for, for the election of a pope. This is before the cardinal was going to come here. And I happened to be walking out with the cardinal Bergoglio. And uh, by this time, I thought he was in the running because there other cardinals had thought of So I said to him, uh, I said, uh, my friend, I said, I think, uh, uh, be careful. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, uh, uh, I understand. I think he must have had some intuition that maybe his name would come up. So uh, they went into the conclave, and I said Mass on the Wednesday, the day after the conclave began in my 
I teach in a church in Rome. Every column has a picture of a church. And I have one of the most beautiful churches in Rome called Santa Maria Sofia Manara. If any of you go to Rome, you don't sit in your house. If you want anything else, I want you to say a prayer for me in Santa Maria Sofia Manara. Uh, it's a beautiful church. It's a, uh, Robert Ross to do, run by the Dominicans. There's a Michelangelo, Philippa Lippi, you name it. Beautiful art. Uh, anyway, that's by the way. Like. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I sit my house for, for the students of the college and lots of others for, for, the, for the carvers in the country. And I came out of the house at about 7 o'clock, and somebody rushed up to me and said, White smoke? But I just can't be so quick. I said, Yes, white smoke? So I said, okay. We're going, to, we're going to go down to the, to the square. So the rector of the English college was there, he had a car, so I said, come on, let's drive down. So we got in the car, but we only got as far as the bridge of St. Angelo, the whole road was going, so we had to abandon the car. I said, the chapel was driving us, dump the car where you can <coughs> and uh, we walked on. And you know, I was very curious, I'd never been at a commentary before as a spectator. And uh, so we were walking down, you know, the road that leads to the square. With the umbrella was raining, and huge crowds. And, uh, and I thought, well, before long, I'll know who, who it's going to be. And, uh, and I remember saying to myself, whoever comes out of that balcony, he's both here and my world here. But I said to myself, I do hope it's better than you. And uh, there we went to the square. And so, the ball in the rain. And, uh, some fellow I knew in the curious, some English archbishop said, come up to my office and get a lovely view. So I went out and we waited there for about half an hour, three quarters of an hour. And, uh, and then the lights went on in the, in the balcony. We knew within a few minutes the new pope would be coming out. So we waited. And then the, 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 the coral, senior coral came out and had said that the famous words, no, it's your vulgus, down your man. I, I announced you good news. We have a pope. Huge cry for it. And then he said, His name is uh, His Eminence Cardinal Lord Jorge Bergoglio. There was dead silence. Nobody ever heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> so then he came out. And he, you know, he didn't say, I'm not preacher sure as the pope. But he just said, What a sir. Good evening. Just brought it all down to earth. And he talked to you, and the first thing he said, you know, knowledge be with you, as the Bishop of Rome, he didn't say that's cool. Uh, and uh, he said, you've gone the wrong way to get, get, a, get, a, get a bishop. Now that's very important, because especially for the Orthodox uh, people, because for them, the, uh, uh, there's a lot of quarreling about the position of the Pope. And, and, uh, but to call himself the Bishop of Rome means uh, that's my first task. Uh, and then he spoke, asked, asked the people to pray for him and I had to pray with him. Very, 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 very funny. Uh, so I come, in, I come in towards the end of what I want to say. Uh, but I, just, I, do, I have a great admiration for Pope Francis and uh, always have done, even when, as I said, even when he was the cardinal. And one of his great, many, many gifts is he speaks to people where they are. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, you might be a, yeah. an Anglican, a Lutheran, an unbeliever. He, he speaks on, on a level with them. And he, he, the one morning he got up at half past five, whatever it is, he went outside his room. He lives in this hostel, he doesn't live in that palace. And outside his room was a Vatican guard standing there, as the uh, Swiss guard. So he said to the this cat, he said, How long have you been standing? So he said, Four hours. Oh, he says the Pope. You must be very tired. I'll get a chair. And sit down. <laughs> so, so, the, so the man said, Holy Father, no, I can't accept the chair. But why not, says the Pope. Mm -hmm. He said, well, because the captain of the guard said, I've got to remain standing. So the Pope said, look here, he said, I'm the captain of the captain. I'm getting you a chair. And then he went in and got, got him a, a sandwich or something. It's very simple. He looks at people, poor people are landing at Lampedusa, the island in the south of Torsa, and the island south of Italy. He hears about the, the poor refugees, and the first thing he does is get a plane and goes down there. And uh, just to be with them. The editor of the, uh, the uh, Republic, one of the, who's an unbeliever, written to the Pope about that. Pope, 
and so forth. So they went and had a wonderful a talk together. And I think that's what endears him, not just to the Catholic Catholics, but fellow Christians uh, and people beyond. Uh, I, met, I met a chap where I live up two things. He said that the morning car was so soon afterwards. I rather like you know, that, that car, that, that new pulp of yours. He said, I like the cut of his chin. <laughs> Very English, you know, like that. Right? Yeah, so I think he has, uh, he's a breath of fresh air. Yeah? I think, um, and this is why, the, uh, the three things that are crucial in the Vatican Council, that's going back now 50 years, it often happens that councils of the church take at least 50 years to, to mature. And in this book, we have three aspects of the Vatican Council which are very, very important for the future of the church. One is something called collegiality, namely that the Pope, uh, it's not just the Pope that sort of rules the church, the church is governed in a collegial way, the Pope with the bishops. Yes, in some ways we're under Peter, but also we're with him. He is appointed the nine cardinals just to be, to be with him in, in deciding various aspects of the church life. And then synodality, that the synod is not just a, a, a talking shop, it's actually going to make decisions which the Pope will, will comply with. Uh, and, and that's bishops who come from all over the world who will have listened to their priests and people. So you get something of the faith of the church that's brought to the very centre of the church. And thirdly, a, a word that's very important in all aspects of life, but also in the church, subsidiarity. Namely, in some ways, particularly over the last 50 years, the church has become too centralized because the church is, in fact, the bishop of his priests and people. That's where the church is alive and well. And subsidiarity means that there will be not more authority, but there will be more, uh, as it were, opportunity for local churches, that's the diocese and local countries, to actually see how do we in our country. Uh, bring the gospel alive. And how do we deal with the different situations? Whatever it is, the divorce, the marriage, the sorts of things that can come up. And I think that also is very, very uh, important. It doesn't take away at all from the, from the centrality of, uh, of, of the, the, the role of the Pope. Uh, and it's a great blessing uh, to have a Pope. Uh, and, uh. So I think that's more or less all I want, I want to say. And uh, the last thing, perhaps, uh, <coughs> call this uh, a year of, of mercy. Uh, uh, I gave a, a, a talk to, I gave a, a, a discussion with Pope Francis. He said, Who is Jorge Bergoglio? And, and the Pope said, He said, I don't know. But I think the most fitting description of me is, I am a sinner. Uh, yes, me, a sinner whom the Lord has looked upon. And he, he's, he's uh, asked for a year of mercy this year. And, and I, I'd like to leave you with that thought because you know, you know when you walk along with a pebble in your shoe, that, there's something in all of us that, that, uh, that needs forgiveness of, of God. And, and he, the Pope is saying, God does forgive. He's going to be with him, somehow reach out to him, and know that he's a, a, a God of mercy. He's, Jesus said, I came to call the just, not the just, but, uh, but the sinners. So, my advice to you is no advice really, just be yourselves at a very deep level, and, uh, and be encouraged by. Uh, the strange history of the church over the last 60 years, especially since the Pope John and the Vatican Council, which I believe is even now only coming to fruition and into maturity, as the, the church has to face this new kind of world which you're facing. And how does the, the church proclaim the gospel, the good news, in our day and our time? But what we do believe is that it has the capacity now in all kinds of ways, but especially 